Hi everyone, welcome. I'm George Farrar, and it's time for Jax 87. Jacksonville as it was in the year 1987. There was a big celebration in downtown Jacksonville on June 25th, 1987, because the Jacksonville Landing was opening to the public. The Jacksonville Landing was envisioned as a riverfront marketplace, a festival marketplace for retail, dining, entertainment, all sorts of fun right on the bank, the North Bank of the St. John's River. And we can see the Jacksonville Landing as it was in the 1980s. We see the old City Hall since demolished in the distance. There was so much vibrancy at the landing and so much excitement because of all of this anticipation. Something grand, something big. It captured a lot of people's imagination. And as a child, I would witness the first, at some point within the first couple weeks, quite vividly, the Jacksonville Landing. And for many years, many years, I would walk along the river and enjoy what the landing had to offer. It was started out professionally managed by a, an organization called the Rouse Company. They managed marketplaces in different cities, and the uh, there were high hopes for the landing. And I can say, in the first 10 years, I really enjoyed it. Here we see a typical Banana Republic clothing store. Uh, and uh, it, what you could imagine it, it looked like somewhat uh, at the landing. I remember that store vividly and, and really uh, it captured my imagination. Uh, the sharper image. <laughs> now the sharper image, you could have you could have taken everything that was in the sharper image and uh, said, here you go, and I would have been just satisfied back when I was a kid. I really was intrigued and really enjoyed my visits to the sharper image at the landing. Lots of different devices. You could have that chair you could sit in, it would massage your back. Uh, it very much, I think, lived up to its billing as a grand festival marketplace on the river. You would have these special moments, especially around holidays, New Year's, Fourth of July. You got a chance to really enjoy yourself downtown. Now I'm going to show you another picture, and a picture can say a thousand words, so I'm going to keep my words brief. Uh, we all know that the Jacksonville Landing in the year 2019 was demolished. In the course of my show work, as you could call it, for what I bring you, um, I, I talk some, in some ways very casually about the changes of, of the city over decades and hundred uh, hundred years and, and so. But this one, this one, this one struck a blow at me. Um, a lot of great memories at the landing. Now it'll be it's expected to be replaced by Parkland. But let's go ahead and look at the Jacksonville of 1987 and how things have changed. The Golf Life Building. Now we're going to start to see, as we pan over towards San Marco and the South Bank, the Prudential Building, Baptist Medical Center, and we see the Acosta Bridge, the original road span, the Acosta Bridge, built in 1921, and the rail span, uh, the railroad uh, span, built in 1925. In 1987, I would ride over. The Acosta, the old Acosta road span with my family. And in the distance, we see the Four Warren Bridge. At the time, that was I-95. And when you got across the river towards downtown on the Acosta, guess what you would see? You'd see the 666 building. Now, many years prior, there was this businessman who sold a cold relief tonic. And he discovered that he could make a lot of money from this building. Why? Near the railroad tracks and near the river. At one point, the river had a lot of port activity. And of course, well, the railroad, that says it all right there. I was always intrigued by that building. Um, I would ride by as a youngster. 
So a lot of cool architecture still around then. And if you take a look, you can see the old, um, the old uh, ramp coming off of the Acosta. And as we pull back, you see the 666 building on the left-hand side corner. You see the newly revitalized old rail station, which became our convention center. You see I-95 in the distance. And again, take a look at the dis in the distance. And then here, the Times Union Jacksonville Journal building. All right, uh, Florida Times Union no longer occupies this building. Uh, and in 1987, we still had the Jacksonville Journal, which would, from what I recall, put out an afternoon paper. At one point, we had our own local newspaper, Jacksonville Journal. It folded into the Times Union, and they allowed them to go ahead and keep producing, uh, as I recall, an afternoon paper. And that was, I believe, within a year or so of ending. Okay. For of that separate edition each day. So, uh, the Florida National Bank, okay, you see coastal parking, you see this building here, but you see the sign, the Florida National Bank, and it's actually, you won't see the bank itself, but the signs were rather distinctive, and, and, and when you look, and you take a look at some of the different things downtown here, there's a lot here, more than meets the eye. Look down to the lower uh, bottom, and you'll see the McCrory's, a little glimpse of the McCrory's. Uh, you look straight ahead. That was the Atlantic Bank building. They went through a merger or some sort of acquisition and it ended up being First Union. Uh, Barnett Bank in the distance. And it looks like the temperature was either, I believe, 81 or 87 degrees Fahrenheit that day. Um, this is the Jacksonville uh, that I vividly remember. Um, the memories from 1987 uh, are certainly more vivid uh, as each year goes by because I grew up here. Look in the distance. Do you see the, uh, it looks like a, a paper mill plant, uh, whatever that is off in the distance. So, And uh, so downtown still had, obviously, and always does really, had, had the bank uh, buildings. But things were changing, of course. Now, speaking of things changing, Mayor Jake Godbold was going to leave office in 1987. When I look at Jake Godbold, I think of him as the people's mayor, the closest mayor I think we've ever had to the working people of the city in modern times. And he had a vision. He wanted to revitalize the city. He wanted to put Jacksonville on the map, and he worked very hard to do it. And while there would be, in his second term, uh, questionable staff choices, it was time to move on, and he had done a lot for the city. And it was time for us to have a new mayor, and that mayor was Tommy Azuri. And he was a state representative in the Florida legislature, and he took office on July 1st, 1987, and he very much had an agenda. He was the first local politician that I really had enough sense, I guess, really to root for in some ways. Um, it was the first local election campaign that I can really remember, and I remember being intrigued by him, seeing him on TV. I had the, of all things, I just happened to be of all places, the dedication of the Mandron Library, one of those places where you had to kind of just, uh, as a kid, you just, just hold your little soda and your cookie and eat it, and then, oh, look, that's the state representative, Tommy Azuri, wow, coming into the room, and wow, okay. And for me, it was all a big deal, right? So he takes office, and he vows in a lot of ways he wants to clean up the city. Now, I might make the argument that Jake Godbold did a lot to clean up the city, particularly downtown, and you can see those uh, earlier pictures in the, in the show. But there were definitely concerns, I think, about the good old boy system, someone new coming along. And so in this Ed Gamble cartoon, uh, it says private members only, and it says good old boys lodge and city hall, and Tommy Azuri's coming in the clean with the cleaning lady, which is the new city council, and the, the, the eyes looking from the, like the distance of the, of the windows and the door, there's like a bat. And so he's coming in to clean, clean up. He's going to clean up the city in that, in that regard as to what's going on in city hall, maybe things going on, whatever, right? 
<clears throat> so there were high hopes for him, and I, uh, I and and I remember in my own way having high hopes for him because I used to ride the school bus, and as part of our mandated desegregation plan. Uh, in the sixth grade and seventh grade, I had to be bused downtown, and that quite crimped my style. And it stressed out me, and it stressed out my parents, and I had to sit in these long lines of traffic in the morning, and those buses got hot, and the, uh, you'd, uh, it used to be humid, and uh, you'd be the carbon monoxide, and the whole nine yards, and the, if you can imagine what it was like, uh, and I'm sure many of you out there lived it uh, quite vividly as commuters in the 1980s, possibly, and I learned the, uh, the, com the, the ways of commuting, at least if anything, as a writer on a school bus going from the suburb of Mandarin uh, off of a, a Dimsdale Road off of a Hartley an old St. Augustine transferring buses at Crown Point Elementary to take the bus downtown to uh, Arby Daniels and Matthew Gilbert and Missouri was on to the toll thing and he really was um, going to be aggressive and we'll talk about that next year <laughs> Jack's 88 about that and he wanted to clean up the city particularly, of course, though, the pollution. So uh, the pollution was a big problem, and I remember I talked about that with you in Jack's 85. And I think, if I recall correctly, that the city was facing fines. Certain, there certain fines were being levied because there were certain pollution standards that were not being met, and they had to go through, and they had to really make the effort to, uh, to take the stink out of the city. And uh, it was a stink that I can remember, and uh, it was something that, that was a real big push. So his big agenda items were tolls and the pollution and working to get all of that resolved and to get things to where uh, we had a better quality of life uh, in the environment. And if there really, you could say there was a legacy with Missouri, certainly that was the cornerstones of his legacy. In regards to that now he would also then have the responsibility at least so far as whatever he was involved with as mayor to get the skyway up uh, though there was that a construction firm a French construction firm had already been selected so we know though that Tommy Azuri only serves the term uh, he later goes on to be on the school board and then more recently incarnates himself on the city council elected and uh, I'll reserve further commentary about uh, Missouri, let us look at people's accomplishments, right? So also in law enforcement, Sheriff Dale Carson was replaced by, pictured here, Jim McMillan. So there was changes at the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. Dale Carson had been a longtime sheriff. Changes in Tallahassee. Governor Graham became Senator Graham. United States Senator Graham, uh, he was uh, promoted by the people of Florida, essentially, elected to, to one of the seats in the Senate for Florida. And I believe he was one of the politicians, I think, that who really deserved it. Uh, so, and then here we have Republican Bob Martinez. Now, I was really intrigued by Bob Martinez. Now, he would only serve a term as governor of Florida. I was really, he was our first Hispanic governor, and I was really just intrigued. It was, I think, his... He kind of in some ways, and, and here we have Ronald Reagan, I started getting in, really interested at the time in Republicanism, and so that was how I started uh, my approach to, to politics and things like that. Now, President Ronald Reagan visited Jacksonville in December 1987. Here he is uh, giving a speech, and Ed Gamble couldn't resist making a remark about the superintendent Herb Sang. Now, Herb Sang was a longtime school superintendent. This maybe is some ways you could see the writing on the wall. You see the school board to the right there. We'll sit down, Herb. He's not talking about us. <laughs> and, uh, and it has like Herb Sang in the Duval County Public School System, or Duval County School System, welcome President Reagan. And Reagan says, I hope this speech puts an end to that negative group who. <laughs> so it, it, it looks like there's some animosity and ultimately, um, Herb Sang uh, would uh, no longer be school superintendent, be replaced in 1989. Now, speaking of the 1980s, I got to talk with you about Tom Petty. Um, he performed in the Jacksonville Coliseum in 1987. Of course, I wasn't there. <laughs> uh, but his music in the 1980s, starting in the mid-80s, his music got on my radar. 
And then I heard he was from Gainesville. He had moved out. He later moved out to California, but he lived in Gainesville. And I loved like the music. Don't come around here no more. Uh, later on, I liked his work with the Traveling Wilburys. He had Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, and then he went solo in '89. I really got into his music. Um, there's something I think the stories and speaking from the soul and speaking from the heart. There's something that, that I found in Tom Petty that was amazing. So the music, uh, I, we got more into the music. Now, meanwhile, in Mandarin and suburbs, so they, I talked about Mandarin Feed uh, last time and how it was, I, th- I believe it was called at one point the Hayloft. It was an old ramshackle barn. <clears throat> I would help out a little bit there. And then I my by, but by 87, uh, they had built, they had torn it all down and built a food lion uh, and, put in a Barnett bank and the food line was kind of goofy. We tried to go there at one point and it didn't work out. So back to Winn-Dixie and they built where the, where the Mandarin feed store that my uh, stepmother's father ran uh, is now Bank of America. It used to be a Barnett bank. So it was bulldozed. There was a Barnett bank there. It became a, later on became a Bank of America at the corner of old St. Augustine Road and Hartley. And, and across the way, like across Hartley, was a Will Champ. Uh, and it, it, it just, time was, ch- it, time was really moving very rapidly because Mandarin was, very, was growing so much. They were bulldozing so much and building a bank, a supermarket. They, down, they bulldozed all these pine trees and built something called Cooper's Hawks Apartments. And I would be fascinated looking on the bus, looking over at it. Um, my father would worked at WGXT Channel 4 as a broadcast engineer and he um, he got a chance he talked about driving the satellite truck and he would talk about how people would be driving he'd be driving a satellite truck down the interstate and people would be slowing down and paralleling them to look at it because the satellite truck was very much a novelty and 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 I don't know my, by 1987 by 1987 my father and uh, my uh, stepmother and I I was growing up we were under, there was a lot going on, okay? Uh, and here, hey, you know, sometimes we told, hey, go get the phone book, right? This is a 1987 phone book. Uh, and this is around the time 911 was actually like, okay, if you need emergency help, emergency help you have to dial 911. And they made this big campaign and, and all of that. And, of course, here you see all the law enforcement fire truck vehicles out. This probably is maybe around Metropolitan Park or something. So... There's a lot going on. My my stepmother's working down in Bayard. My father's working hard at Channel Four, doing live shots, driving the satellite truck around, you know, uh, once in a while, I guess. And and then you know, I went from the coziness and the fun of R. V. Daniels with Miss Bursinger and the and, and the band. Miss Bursinger was my favorite teacher and. I got a lot of interest in social studies from her. But then in the seventh grade, I popped into Matthew Gilbert. And pardon the oversized glasses. I had a lot going on. I had band. I had to try to make sure I wasn't losing my clarinet. Leave you on the bus. Is it in the band room? Is it in the classroom? Oh, no. No, you can't go up the down stairwell. Lockers. Lockers. Jim Locker. A locker. Coach Raspberry. Tuck your shirt in your pants. Um, and in the meantime, somehow I found a way to get uh, a yellow belt in Taekwondo. Uh, <laughs> Um, I had good times and great teachers, um, and I'll talk more about that next time. Uh, but there were some interesting uh, things that went on. But generally, I got along well with people enough to where I was elected onto the student council as a representative. I started to get interested in student government. Uh, so I was always trying to find ways that I could be involved. Uh, and here's where we leave things off. Um, in the next year, 1988, my life is going to radically change in a way to this day. I can't even comprehend how I got through it, but that's stories for another day. I want to thank you for watching. Take it easy. See you later.